Okay, well good morning. Today is 25 January 2020. My name is Jay Waters. I'm with the Voices of Freedom Project and the National Museum of American Wartime. We're in Twin Mountain, New Hampshire, and it's a pleasure today to be with Michael Creeden, a longtime friend. And Mike, good morning. If you would, though, for the record, just give us your full name and your, your date of birth, please. Good morning. Uh, full name, Michael John Creeden. And born in Long Branch, New Jersey. Excellent. And we'll get into more detail, but what, what major conflicts or war did you uh, participate in? Uh, I participated in the Global War on Terror with two uh, deployments to Afghanistan. Okay. And uh, thinking back to your, your family members, did you have any uh, family members that before you had served in the military, Absolutely. father, uncles, grandpa, grandparents? Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead and tell us a little bit about that, please. So my grandfather on my father's side was a quartermaster in the Navy in World War I, and in World War II was an ensign fire instructor in Norfolk. Uh, my father was an infantryman with the 69th Infantry Division during World War II in the European campaign. He was a 60 millimeter uh, mortar squad leader, um, and, um, and I followed in the family business, so to speak. Yeah, I understand you had some opportunities to, to, especially with your dad, to discuss some of his um, time in, in conflict. I absolutely did. So yeah. my dad would tell stories up to a certain point. He passed recently, but in the last three months of his, uh, of his life, he, he got a lot more um, detailed and brought some closure to, to a few stories. Some of them were, were comical and some of them were, uh, were, were quite tragic and serious. One of some of the more comical ones were as he, uh, he actually crossed uh, the Rhine River and uh, liberated a wine cellar mm -hmm. in, in France from the Germans and brought the, brought the wine back uh, to his uh, squad. Uh, his uh, senior officers were none too pleased with that activity because he was, he was ahead of the forward line of troops. But uh, they, they took the wine from him, put him on guard duty, and apparently they had quite a party that night. Excellent, excellent. And, and having grown up with you and knowing your dad, your dad was a great, great American. Um, I understand there was a great ceremony at Arlington Cemetery for his interment. And uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, Jay. Yeah, he uh, he then after after his service uh, spent uh, thirty years as a research and development uh, scientist, physicist with the Department of the Army, uh, and many of the things that uh, he worked on in the seventies. Uh, we're actually seeing uh, being fielded in the in the army and the navy uh, presently. So he was uh, he was quite uh, he's quite the scientist in addition to being a patriot. Absolutely. Um, well, thinking switching gears a little bit. Think back to September 11th, 2001, the attack on America. Where were you that day? Uh, just kind of talk us through what happened to you personally that day. Certainly, I was uh, I was a civilian at that point uh, working with Exxon Mobil. Uh, we were in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, we were at a conference. Uh, I was, was out of Texas and had flown up there. Uh, it was with the Exxon Mobil Research and Engineering Company at the time, and I was a section head, and we were doing a team building amongst all the section heads across the world. And uh, I remember that day, as most Americans do vividly, probably most people around the world, uh, watching the television sets of, of the towers coming down. And I, I got to tell you, I, I was watching that and my brain wasn't functioning because I hadn't heard about the airplanes. And these people are all looking at the TV set that was above a bar, just staring at it. And this tower came down and I was being a little bit of my cynical, sarcastic self. Like, well, why is everyone watching this boat building implode? So what? And then the brain registered. It was like, oh my, mm. that's not just any building. That's the building I grew up with uh, Sandy Hook watching from a distance. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, so, so it began. So we were under attack. Um, I was with a, a person who had just got out of the Marine Corps at the time, and we, uh, we considered uh, jumping in a car and going to ground zero to do anything we could. Uh, we, we chose not to, but uh, I can tell you at that moment in time, uh, my life changed forever. And uh, as soon as I got home, uh, I, I put my packet in to uh, be reinstated in, in the military. And yeah. a few years later, I was reinstated. Okay. Yeah, and we'll come, we'll come back to that. Was there anything unique happening in the Fairfax area as related to the Pentagon? So we knew about the attacks on the Pentagon. We weren't too far away from it. We didn't fully understand the severity of it. The New York press was, was somewhat taking um, more of the airwaves. But I do recall um, the skies obviously going silent. Uh, our, all of our flights were, were canceled. 
uh, make a long story short on that, we ended up driving all the way back down to Texas. We had to rent a car and we said, well, you know, possession's ours. And we took that car and we drove all the way down. Uh, and that was a little bit spooky. But the one thing I do remember about the Fairfax area is when President Bush returned um, to, to the White House, uh, his his helicopters flew directly mm. um, over over the hotel, and that I okay. remember because that was the first time I had seen um, you know an attack formation of helicopters, and they were uh, they were obviously uh, in business. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's interesting about the uh, the story like that of getting back to Texas because the as you know and just said the ground the air transportation was shut down for about a week. Yep, and that was it was absolutely surreal to look up in the sky and know that there was nothing up there, mm -hmm. um, and we and we drove and uh, as you recall the the nation was someone in a state of shock. Well, then uh, going back in time a little bit, what what drove you or what led you for your initial uh, time into the military? I had to say my my father was was the greatest influence in that regard. Uh, so my initial time in the military was I, I, uh, I went to the United States Military Academy. So in 1983, uh, six days after I graduated from, from high school, I showed up at our day on July 1 and uh, began, began my military career. And, and he's, his, his influence on uh, what he was able to accomplish through that experience um, shaped me as a 17 and 18 year old. And, uh, and I chose that path. Well, and I'm sure then, so 1987, you graduated, probably a big day for the Creedon family as your mom and dad and other folks came up, right? It was a huge day. Yeah. Uh, my grandmother came out from Missouri. She was very, uh, very ill at the time with cancer. Uh, it was a big, big family, uh, big family, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It was a social festive event. Uh, and then I graduated, and, and at that point, I uh, got assigned to the 24th Infantry Division down in Fort Stewart, Georgia. Did a quick tour through Fort Knox to go through Armor Basic course, and then a Bradley Commander certification course, and then joined my uh, joined my platoon in Fort Stewart, uh, Georgia. Uh, interesting story about that. Uh, uh, I chose Fort Stewart, Georgia because at the time the 24th Infantry Division was part of the Rapid Deployment Force, and and I wanted to do that. Upon arrival at Fort Stewart and checking in, I thought I was going to be a a uh, cavalry mm -hmm. uh, platoon leader. Um, but uh, they changed it and said, no, you're going to be straight up armor platoon leader. And oh, by the way, uh, we're going to assign you to a platoon that has no soldiers. It just has the NCOs. And in two and a half years, your unit will be rotating over to Korea because you are part of this new experiment called cohort. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I remember going, well, wait a minute now. I <laughs> If I had wanted to go to Korea, I would have chosen to go to yeah, Korea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I chose to go to Georgia, and I was hoping to have some soldiers. Uh, not, none of those uh, turned out to be accurate. So, uh, yeah, I started off my military career with just uh, tank commanders, gunners, and me. There you and go. and uh, mon every Monday, we'd go down to the motor pool and, and do maintenance on tanks that didn't move because we didn't have full crews. And we waited for our uh, basic training uh, um, graduates to join us, and that, that happened about nine months later. Okay. And so did you guys eventually go to Korea or how'd that work out? So eventually the unit did go to Korea. I got out uh, before they went to Korea, but the, the cohort unit actually did deploy over there. Uh, we spent two years, uh, the infamous crawl, walk, run with the soldiers to create teams and then including gunnery and then RTEPs and then culminating in a national training center rotation. And then the unit did move over to, to Korea. Okay. Okay, so did you, uh, uh, on your active duty, your initial active duty time, was it just the training at Fort Knox and Fort Stewart, or did you have any other assignments? Uh, one, I guess you would, we didn't call it a deployment at the time, but we went to Turkey for a, um, for a month uh, and uh, did joint maneuvers okay. with the Turkish Army uh, pretty near what would have been, uh, you know, the Soviet border or yeah. at least their, their satellite country's border. And uh, I believe the, it was called Operation Determination or, or Display Determination, something like that. And it was a joint exercise to demonstrate to, to the, uh, at the time, Soviets. Uh, you know, we were capable of sending a battalion over on a moment's notice, heavy battalion over on a moment's notice, and uh, land, uh, maneuver them, uh, fire them, and, and, and race up to the quote-unquote border. Yeah, how, how was that working with the Turks? What, what was your impression of them professionally and militarily? Well, I thought that professionally and militarily, they were, they were phenomenal. 
the the part that you had to scratch your head a little bit over is we had M1 tanks and they had M48 tanks mm. right so they were they were definitely not at that point we're talking about the 80s here they were not cutting edge on on their hardware uh and so they were awesome partners with what they had um but uh yeah their equipment wasn't wasn't quite uh, m1 standards at the time okay so um what year did you get out your from your initial active duty tour? i got out of uh, in 1990 and you were a captain at the time no at that time i was a lieutenant Okay. And got out. I swung over to uh, Georgia Tech, got my master's degree, then hired on with Exxon. And then upon arriving in Baytown, Texas, I joined the uh, Texas Army National Guard. Okay. And uh, before any deployments with the Texas National Guard, what was that like coming in? You know, Jersey boy, West Point grad joins the Texas National Guard. Any, any you know, the stereotypes probably are all over the place. They anything. were all over the place. Yeah. That's exactly right. Okay. And so, and at the time, the Texas Guard was uh, heavy with uh, Texas A&M graduates. Okay. And um, there was a, a healthy uh, competition between uh, Texas A&M Corps of Cadets and, and the United States Military Academy uh, uh, cadets or, or graduates. And, and to be brutally honest, I, I wasn't tremendously welcome uh, when I first arrived there. But I had something that they did not. They had M68-3s and they were transitioning to M1s. And I had grown up on M1s. So suddenly I was a subject matter expert and was of value to that to them. And uh, yeah, they tolerated me and eventually they, you know, I, I settled in and I was just like everybody else. Uh, but I had something to offer and I was able to break through it. Otherwise, it would have been... Um, it might have been a short tour with the Texas Guard at the time. <laughs> but it sounds like, Mike, from what I know, you did very well with the Texas National Guard. Just not to fast forward too much, you're now a very senior officer. And so how did the, how much time did you spend in the Texas Guard and what kind of stood out, anything particular? So I, I spent a little less than two years with okay. the Texas Guard, um, but I was a platoon leader. I was an executive officer. I was about ready to take command of a company. And then Exxon uh, moved me to, to New Jersey. Um, I, f upon arrival in New Jersey, uh, met with the New Jersey Guard to try to further my career. Uh, I can still remember this discussion with the brigade commander. Uh, and he, he just looked at me, looked at my record. We had an awesome interview. And he said, Mike, I, I got to be honest with you. I already know we're going to go down from one brigade to two brigade or, or a brigade down to one battalion. I've got a lot of people who uh, have worked very, very hard to be at. I would have to put you on top of them. I tell you what, I will make a deal with you. If you come in as a lieutenant and give up your captain rank, I will make sure that I, I sort through that at some later date. That's your that's my offer, and of course within the guard that was completely above water. But you, you commissioned each state differently. I could have commissioned with them as a lieutenant, and there was a little voice in my head that said, "No, you can't. You can't go backwards on rank." Um, and so I didn't. Yeah. And it was no hard feelings. I understood. And sure enough, six months later they they went. They had to cut fifty percent, and so I understood that. And um, so at that point I was put into the reserves. Okay. Well then, uh, and I know at some point I don't want to jump too far ahead, but you became a civil affairs officer, is that correct? That is right. That that happened, uh, that would be a jump uh, from 1996 to 2005. So those were the years that I was I was out completely. Mm -hmm. um, I gave up my commission, and then after 9-11, put in my packet to get commissioned again. Took a few years, uh, some comedies associated with that, but nevertheless, I, I eventually arrived and... Uh, I was commissioned as a civil affairs officer, so okay. I was not commissioned. I did not return as an armor officer because the reserves don't have or didn't have at the time uh, armor units. Um, so they commissioned me as a civil affairs officer captain. And, and were you still in New Jersey or Texas or somewhere else? No, at that point I was in Texas. Back in, or in Texas and as a reserve unit. Okay. Correct. Okay. So then um, I guess moving forward a little bit, you've, you've had multiple deployments. Let's talk about whatever unit and where you were rank wise as you were getting ready for your first deployment? First deployment, I was a captain. Um, interesting about that preparation, um, the majority of my unit at that point, so this is 2005 and 2006, had been over to Iraq at least once, mm -hmm. uh, in some cases twice. Uh, I'm sure each, each uh, 
uh, component will tell you that they deployed more than everybody else. But civil affairs in the reserves, because there wasn't a very big active duty footprint, mm -hmm. deployed a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I was surrounded by um, a lot of veterans of, of Iraq. And so I was definitely, um, with my you know, lack of anything on my right sleeve, uh, stood out. So that wasn't necessarily an easy transition either. But I spent the first two years... Uh, learning how to be a team chief, learning about civil affairs, went to the variety of schools, um, had a quick um, uh, session to the Philippines mm. um, where I spent about a month over in the Philippines uh, associated with, a, with an operation there uh, and then basically got ready and we thought we were going to Iraq and then eventually got the call to, uh, to go to Afghanistan. Okay. Well, so let's talk a little bit about Afghanistan, like where you were and kind of your, your, your role, what you were doing. So my first tour was in 2007 and I was a team chief. Uh, we were attached to the uh, 173rd. Uh, I was uh, with the 1st of the 91st Cavalry Squadron and we were at a place called Naray, which later became uh, Fob Bostic. Yeah. Um, and so at the time, there was maybe 100 or so soldiers up in the two provinces up there. That was Nuristan and, and Kunar. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was the team chief. I went over with two sergeants. And our primary duties were to implement the Commander's Emergency Relief Program. Uh, we were on the cutting edge. I say cutting edge of, of COIN. And so uh, my my mission was to get as many projects up and running, get as many people working as possible, and try to jumpstart a little bit, to the extent we could, the economy through, through construction. And so I managed rough numbers, seven to $10 million worth of projects. All of them were very small, building schools, building roads, building walls, wells, um, plowing for snow, just anything to, to get um, people um, working with the stated goal to connect them to the government, um, it, all in the name of the gyro, right? So what can we do to get, get the, the name of, of the Afghanistan government as something that these two provinces wanted to be part of? And we were attempting to do that through economic development. And so we spent a lot of time uh, approving projects, uh, paying for projects, QCing projects, meeting with village elders to figure out what uh, they would be interested in to, to connect them to, to their village people. Um, and we spent a lot of time outside the wire um, uh, trying, to, trying to make a difference. And, and I think, as you said, you're, you're still a captain at this point. I was I was a captain until I went on my mid tour break. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I became a major. So uh, I left uh, left as a captain. Uh, my orders came through while I was in transit to Kuwait on the way back to to the U.S. to see my family, and I actually pinned on 04 in Kuwait, uh, which is a little bit of a funny story. Um, I had a yeah. So you you said you were on mid tour leave in Kuwait, and you. Got promoted, it sounds I like. got promoted, and it's a funny story. Uh, it, there was a big promotion ceremony for a different captain at mm. Bagram, um, and, and I, I kind of fell down on myself. I was like, well, wait a minute. Where's my big promotion ceremony? But be that as it may, I went on mid-tour leave um, with, a, with a sergeant, with two sergeants, and uh, they, we went to the Kuwaiti, uh, where the flagpoles are there on the post, and uh, one of them, uh, I somehow got a hold of the orders and read the orders out loud. And the other sergeant pinned me on and promoted me. And there I was. So you, uh, you read your own order. I basically, <laughs> I almost read my own. I had, a, I had one of my trusted sergeants read, read the orders. And, and the funny story is, no sooner than I had pinned on and they, they took a picture of me, then a different major came racing over and uh, proceeded to, and he so wanted to yell at me. And he came running over, and then he realized that I was a major, and all of a sudden, okay, now I gotta talk to this guy slightly different. 
And he's like, you can't take photos here. This is a non-photo. We don't want you to take photos. I said, all right. I just got promoted. I'm just, I'm just taking a picture of a flagpole. He's like, all right, all right, all right. But you got to stop. And I'm like, got it. Check. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So yeah, so oh, you know, it's never over, Jay. Didn't first, my first thing as a major was I got my buttocks chewed by yeah, somebody else, by another major, <laughs> by another major. But he didn't confiscate your camera, at least. He did so. not. So uh, maybe he should have, but uh, I was okay. Well, for and so for somebody that maybe doesn't know as much about civil affairs, you've kind of hinted at small teams out at remote bases. Maybe just describe that a little bit more. Yeah, well, the job of the civil affairs is try to bridge between a maneuver commander and the, the population that they're, that they're the battle owners or battle space owners. And so we're the entity that tries to do certain operations and certain activities to help promote whatever the maneuver commander's objectives are. If the maneuver commander is settled in an area and they are struggling with uh, people uh, doing harm or blocking their operations, we try to figure out how to flip the civilian population to, to further or aid um, the commander's intent. And so as a small team, we try to go out and meet with, with elders in case of Afghanistan or government officials or villagers, try to get a, a, a tone of the population and come up with recommendations for activities to try to, whatever the objectives of the commander are, um, further them. If, if the commander wants peace, we try to figure out how to get peaceful you know, civilians. If the commander wants people out of the way for maneuverability, we try to figure out how to get people out of the way for maneuverability. If, the, if they want local services, we try to figure out how to you know, put people to work. Maybe it's laundry, maybe it's uh, helping out with, uh, with fruits and vegetables. Sure. Uh, anything we can do that furthers what the, that commander wants as it relates to the civilian population. We're also supposed to be the subject matter experts of the area that we occupy for cultural, historic, religious, economic, banking, judicial, uh, educational, any of the other kind of major pillar systems that you would anticipate you'd see in a civilian community. We're supposed to help the commander with any of those uh, issues. And it's a very tough job, so it's not necessarily that we know all that going into it, but we are expected to figure it out pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. And then did either you or anybody on your team speak the the local language, any Pashto or Urdu? Or... We, d we did not, but we were also one of the few people that had a dedicated interpreter okay. with us at all times. And our interpreter could, could speak several languages, including uh, Nuristani, which Nuristani is only like 1% of, of mm. uh, the population of Afghanistan actually speaks it. And... We, this is going to come as a shock. It's in Nuristan, yeah. right? And that's what they only speak in Nuristan. Okay. And it's not a written language. So if mm. you don't if you don't have someone who can actually grow up in speaking it, you're not going to communicate in, in Nuristan. Um, at the time, Nuristan was and is um, on the Pakistani border. And so um, a variety of bad guys uh, were using that as, as a point of entry because right. there was a lot less... Um, monitored than some of the stuff going on down south. Sure, sure. Well then, um, so we're going to jump to your second deployment and then I'm going to ask you some general questions that can, you can then answer from either deployment. Sure. So if, just to kind of set the stage. So so then let's talk about that second deployment. You went back to Afghanistan, what years and what role? All right, so the second deployment was um, from 2011 to 2012. I was a major and I was a company commander at the time. So. Most military units, company commanders are captains, but in civil affairs, uh, a company commander is a major, and that's mostly because uh, civil affairs in general is mm -hmm. somewhat rank heavy. As a team chief, I was a captain. My team was two or three people. As a company commander, I had uh, we, we made we were slightly off doctrine because we had too many posts to cover. So we had six teams and uh, a headquarters element. So as a major. Um, I brought over 32 people, and we were assigned to uh, regional command north, and my headquarters was in Razar Sharif, and I had teams spread out through all of northern Afghanistan in the provincial uh, construction teams, and mostly the international teams. So I had a team associated with Norwegians, I had a team uh, associated with Germans, um, with the Swedes, uh, so we were, we were all over the country in small two- and three-person elements. Uh, helping these uh, PRCs um, do their job, reconstruct some of the some of the provinces. 
we were the ability for that team to access U.S. funds. So we were able to approve projects and, and so the Swedes could access U.S. dollars to, to, do, to do good. Uh, in addition to whatever their countries were, were proposing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the two years leading up to that uh, were interesting in that um, Haiti um, occurred, the, um, the, the horrible earthquakes down there. And we were, we were almost, well, we were activated for a while. We were almost pointed down to that, and that kind of galvanized our training. Um, and then we went, to, uh, we went to Afghanistan the second time. Yeah, and, and maybe you can talk about this too. I kind of remember uh, on the regional command north, the northern regions was a little bit more stable. And then with some stability, some of the projects that you and the teams were doing were perhaps a little bit more successful. Was there any truth to what I'd heard? Or No, you're, you're spot on. The, the northern part of the country was more stable. However, there were some elements. So in general, the bad guys, and, and I, I say bad guys in quotes because that was one of the fascinating things I found about Afghanistan. There was all sorts of bad guys, and they all had different motives. Uh, we, we gloss it over as, well, simply the Taliban. It was a lot more complicated than that. You had Al-Qaeda, you just had thugs, you had drugs, you had timber, you had gems, you had little mafiosas. There were all sorts of bad guys, and at any moment in time, they, had, they were in conflict with uh, you know, U.S. and international agendas, and sometimes they, they actually furthered them, depending upon what worked for their particular agenda. But in general, the North was, was a lot more stable. It had, it had a lot more Russian influence from, from back in the day, um, and so it was relatively safe, mm-hmm. in quotes, relatively safe. And what we spent the majority of our time doing, uh, as opposed to working schools and wells and and other projects, uh, we built roads. And that was our reason to be. Uh, So we spent the majority of our time identifying, funding, and uh, and paying for the construction of of roads to try to help with that infrastructure. Uh, On my first tour, I, I somewhat learned the hard way that a lot of our projects, good intentions, ultimately got fell into the hands of bad people who did other things with them than our stated intentions. Mm. And so the next time I went over there, I said, you know what? Roads. Whatever they want, we're giving them a road. Uh, the roads are, are, are windows into the soul, their transportation, new ideas can flow on roads, economic can flow on roads, law enforcement can flow on roads, military can flow on roads. Fair enough, the counter argument was so can bad people flow on sure. roads, but yes, you can. But I thought, or we thought at the time, um, that a lot of the issues were um, isolation. Uh, and in isolation, you can create some interesting um, people who may or may not be uh, in tune with, with some of the global norms that we were trying to promote. But roads um, give them access to differing thoughts, education, ideas, opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. That's how the West was won with roads. Uh, and I thought, well, it worked then. Um, we'll try it here. Well, and so maybe describe these roads. I mean, uh, were they dirt roads now packed down or were they traditional, what we would think of in the West, uh, paved roads? What kind of roads were you talking about? Yeah, that's about? an awesome question. They, they are not, you know, four lane highways that you'd see down in Houston. They are absolutely dirt roads, compact with maybe some rock, um, no asphalt, no pavement. These were just right. really... Um, trails that were widened, um, some drainage, uh, so they wouldn't flood out or wash out, but mostly packed down gravel and, and, and dirt. Okay. And I saw on your paperwork here, you mentioned Operation Mountain Highway. Was, was this road project connected to that? No. So on the first tour, that, that was not. Now, Operation, okay. Operation Mountain Highway, um, I got to go backwards a little bit to explain how the, the 91st was, was set up at the time. They had uh, some small fire bases um, to the north of Fob Bostic, where they had a um, an infantry. Um, it was a it was a company minus in one of them. They had a cav uh, company minus in one of them, and they had an artillery um, unit, uh, some 105s. So they had one 105, okay. and and they were on the high ground. Um, and one of them is, is going to be the subject of a movie and it was subject of a book by uh, Jake Tapper, The Outpost. Mm-hmm. That was one of the one of the areas. 
the, there was one road that connected Bostick all the way up through those uh, fire bases. Okay. Um, we lost control of that road. So we actually could not, by road, go to the fire bases that were part of the squadron. We were already, even Bostick was 85% supplied by air. So we were, we were limited on roads from the, from the south regardless. We had no road capability to get up to, to those bases. There was a um, border point, border crossing with Pakistan, okay. manned by the border police. And in January of 2008, it was overrun. Um, there was a special forces detachment up there that got involved in a running uh, gun battle and it did not go well. In fact, um, a Medal of Honor was awarded on that battlefield. Uh, and and uh, I remember that vividly because I, I had to uh, carry um, Sergeant Miller um, off of the helicopter at Bostick to, to what ended up being a makeshift morgue. Mm. Um, so we lost control of that border point completely. And Operation Mountain Highway was a ground assault to okay. retake um, that border border post. Okay. Uh, it was phased, and it began with uh, air insertions um, for the high grounds, and then it began with a ground assault convoy, um, and then the, the next phase was the reestablishment and the bringing up of the border police. And I was part of that phase. And so my civil affairs truck, along with the people from First ID that were training the border police, and about... 30 border policemen um, did a convoy up that road to, to, to the Gowardish Bridge um, to establish that border point again. Uh, and the interesting thing about that was, at the time I was like, well, I, I guess I'm going second in, so all the heavy lifting is going to be done by the ground assault convoy. No, that's not, that's not how that one worked. Hmm. So the ground assault convoy, because it was so meticulously planned and they had such overwhelming firepower, Nobody touched them. Mm. Everyone mm. just faded off in a way, and they just raced up that road and got to their assembly area and, and was done. And then we came up, and everybody knew we were coming up. And so um, that was a little bit of the, of the um, pucker factor, for lack of a better word, is the radio chatter was like, we know you're coming, and now you got the, the flippants, you know, the border police, and we're... Where we took them out once, we're going to take them out again, and it was pretty obvious, one way in, one way out, that um, the bad guys were going to make a statement on, on the second on the second assault. Yeah. Um, well, so did you have any direct combat? Not on that one. They, I guess, they decided that uh, they were going to bark at us, but uh, they they faded away on that one. But we uh, we didn't know that at the time. Now, were they somewhere and just decided the odds were not in their favor? Possibly. Um, but we, uh, and, and they did set off some obstacles in the road that we had to basically blow away some rocks and things like that to, to slow us down, but they did not, uh, they didn't, they didn't take an assault on us. Well, yeah. So the next four or five questions are kind of general questions that can then, since you've got multiple deployments, combat deployments, you can then answer them from both deployments or either one or whatever kind of sure. trips your trigger, so to speak. So. So speaking, the first one is, is directly related to combat operations. Did you and your team come under direct enemy fire, have any direct uh, combat actions? Yes. Yeah, so maybe just describe one or a couple of those. So one, one uh, time we came under fire, uh, I'll give you three stories. Uh, the first time I ever came under fire, besides rockets, uh, but I, honest to goodness, uh, rifles and machine guns uh, was, in, in a, um, was in a small valley, the name escapes me, but it was to the south of our... our our, our area, and uh, we basically went out there, I, I'm not gonna say looking for trouble, but we kind of were. So we, we went down there and we just took residents up in some fields by a river. Um, it was about seven vehicles, six vehicles, formed a coil, and we, were, we wanted and were looking for someone to, to come out and try to engage us um, because we had a lot of other neat weapon systems uh, waiting for them if we could just get them to show themselves. Mm -hmm. sure. And so sure enough, um, they, they showed themselves and um, 
uh, you know, bullets flying over our head. It, it was a hundred degrees. We were just kind of lazing around, but you know, each gun truck had had air watch and and was covering. And sure enough, we started firing. So we all took our all took our positions and uh, started firing back. Uh, they hit us in two different directions. Um, it was harassing fire. It wasn't anything significant, but they were trying to probe us mm -hmm. and. Uh, and the reason why I, I, I remember that is what, what the interesting weapons we had in store. I didn't know it at the time, but as soon as they did, um, they did engage us. A a, um, a ten warthog oh, yeah. uh, was on station yeah. Yeah. and um, came out came out of I won't say out of nowhere because they when they start coming you know they're coming yeah, yeah. and uh, it put on quite a display as it was uh, chasing the retreating whatever it was that attacked us. Um, yeah, so very that, distinctive sound, as I recall. Like, yes, Rrr! and when they when they fire, um, you're like, oh my! Yeah. I'm glad I'm not on the wrong end of that yeah. one. Uh, and uh, so they 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 exacted some, I guess, revenge for lack of a better word. Well, could uh, you see any bad guys, or were they uh, off in the distance? They're off too, in the too distance. far. Yeah, yeah, they were too far. But, uh, but it sounds, I'm sorry. So it sounds like you had a pretty deliberate battle drill and kind of expecting this. So you kind of just go into training mode, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But it, can I can I share Absolutely. with you about it what is. training yeah. mode is? Sure. So remember, I'm an old tanker, and this was the first time I took fire. So I had been trained back in the day that my job as a tank commander was field glasses, spot the enemy, direct the gunner on target. And so I got a Humvee, I've got a gunner, machine gunner, and uh, so we have our doors open, uh, front doors open to provide us some, some cover, and I take my position, and I have my glasses up, and I'm scanning the, the mountains, looking for where to direct my gunner to, to lay down fire. Uh, did that for 15, 20 minutes as the battle went on. We had a mortar with us, and they were firing away, and... And we were probing and shooting, and, and then we also had the ability to listen to some of the radio traffic, so we could kind of figure out if we were getting close by the you know them telling them to move their their people around. Um, but at the conclusion of the battle, I look around. Everyone else has their rifles pointed at the mountain, and I'm the only person with a binocular staring up. And I realized, eh, maybe the adrenaline got the best of me. Maybe next time I should use the rifle instead of the field glasses. But that was my. Uh, well, maybe you wanted to see what you were shooting at. I went that day. Yeah, I. But it, you say you resort to training. That's absolutely how right. I was training. And right. so when the adrenaline spiked, that's what I did. That's what I knew to do instinctively. Even though in an infantry unit, that probably wasn't wasn't as as uh, well needed um, second time we got hit okay so you started to say a, a second a second uh, second time I got we got hit and this is well maybe it's a lot more common now but it wasn't common at that point in time we got hit at night mm. and so around midnight uh, same place uh, same defensive coil um, same level of har harassing fire um, we we got hit uh, now <clears throat> I had a I had several bad habits, but one of my bad habits w was when I would sleep on, on the truck. I wasn't a big fan of sleeping on the ground. I just didn't want to get run over by stuff. And so I slept up on the hood of the Humvee, tucked up against uh, the windshield, mm. and I would have my, my pistol uh, literally under my head. Um, under I had a very small pillow I'd bring up, and that's, that's, how, I, that's, that's how I guarded myself. Which, from a sleeping perspective, makes a lot of sense because the, the whoever was on night watch would start the engine and it was cold and that would warm you up and, <laughs> and it was okay. Uh, except when I obviously had to pull my, my duty. But, but the way this truck was, was oriented was windshield was kind of out. And so when we got attacked at night, um, yeah, I kind of was the very exposed. <laughs> And, and upon reflection, I was like, yeah, you know, that wasn't that wasn't a real good idea either. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to adjust our sleeping patterns or at least have the truck pointed yeah. in such a direction that it's not, not outside in. But, you know, you learn things. And sometimes you learn things the hard way. And as good as your training is uh, before you go into combat, sometimes uh, some lessons just have to be learned the hard way. So, yes, I learned that one. Uh, Experience but, is a great teacher. Right. And the final, well, it's not, I had more, but the, another one, a, a combat action of note, was actually in Camdesh. Um, at the outpost, 
uh, and a, a gentleman and I, he was a law enforcement uh, professional, so he was a civilian at the time. He's in the D DEA, mm. but he was assigned to help train police. Uh, we had gone up to, to Camdesh to, to help with some projects, and we were, we were walking within the little post there, or a little fire post there, um, to go, um, go to the, well, I'll call it the restroom. We called it the tubes. And if anyone knows what the tubes are, it, it kind of, the name kind of explains it all. It's some PVC pipes nailed into the ground and put into usually a rock field so that you can urinate them and it spreads the yeah. urine out and yeah. you don't, you know, that it, so you go to the tubes. That's, that's we were going to the tubes. And another set of uh, harassing fire um, came down on us and uh, that one lasted for quite some time. Mm. So that post was under attack. And I was with the first ID at that time. I had left the 173. They had left ripped out, and and then the the first ID came in, and so that was a that was a battle um, that lasted several hours, mm. um, and so um, yeah, I, I I connect to the outpost, uh, and so eventually when that movie comes out, uh, okay. I'm sure I'll try to to watch it without getting too many flashbacks about it. And the the movie's called what? The Outpost. It's supposed to be The Outpost. It was supposed to be released in 2019. Um, okay. Hasn't been released yet, but uh, hopefully it'll, it'll make it'll see the light of day. We'll have to we'll have to look for it. Well, I saw on your notes, Mike, too, that you also received the the combat action badge. Was was that one of your encounters you've already discussed? Or was that a separate? That was actually a separate one. So the very first uh, one that w uh, it, w it was a rocket attack. Okay. And uh, uh, it was a rocket attack on Fob Bostic. And we were, uh, so we, well, I was um, eating dinner at the time, had a little tray of something that the, the 173rd cooks had, had made up. And you could climb, it was very hot that day, and you could climb up. Uh, above the little facility that they used, it was a mud hut, and they had a little ladder that you went on top, and sometimes you could go up there and eat, and sure enough, um, two rockets came over. I, I'm not gonna tell you that I could reach out and touch them, but here's what I could tell you is, I could see them go over my head very slowly, and then they landed within, I don't know, not too far away. Uh, didn't hurt anybody, didn't, didn't injure anybody, but that was my first, uh, first uh, formal uh, uh, defined uh, combat action and so I, I was within the proximity of the battle damage and, and got that award but yeah. uh, other other more force on force uh, events happened after that yeah well I mean definitely gets your attention and whether, you, got, whether you want the award or not you yep. earned it so yeah so. right well so the, and you can answer this question as you see fit but did you have any um, friends or any of your soldiers specifically wounded or killed in action not at the time I was there, but when I left, um, there were two two soldiers um, that within two weeks after I had uh, ripped out um, were, were injured. One of them, it, it will be uh, the subject of this movie, Captain mm. Yeskis. Um, he was a, a company commander, squadron, uh, troop commander, I'm sure. sorry, getting my uh, armor stuff mixed up. Troop commander up in Camdesh. And I had gone up there to help try to do some projects with him. And we became, uh, I guess, reasonably friendly as, as one does on deployments. And um, he was, uh, there's probably a better word for it, but he was basically assassinated uh, a couple weeks after I left. And then there was a, a, a Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel who, um, who took a shot to the head uh, that I had worked with very closely. Yeah. Um, and he, uh, yeah, he 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 was airlifted out of there. So yes. Um, so well, shifting gears a little bit. So on, yeah, uh, add I, one more to that. Yeah, please. The, go ahead. Uh, and the gunner uh, for um, actually, I remember the valley. It's the Sunel Valley. Um, the gunner for the company commander. So I always traveled with the company commander uh, as a with um, an 0708. I always traveled with with them. I was. It's that that person's right hand man. I worked with the squadron commander, the lieutenant colonel, but I would always travel with with the, with the captains, as as and we would basically do civil affairs jointly. Right. right. And his gunner uh, was an awesome guy, and he went back with the fourth ID for a second tour to Afghanistan, and he was one of the people killed mm. in that battle at, at a place called Libert and. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, and is the subject of the outpost, so you'll 
Not that I have any stock in the movie. No, but we definitely. If you do watch the movie, you'll learn about certain. I, I like I like seeing those kind of movies. Um, well, then <clears throat> shifting gears a little bit on a maybe a more positive or happier note. So, on either of your deployments, how did you stay in touch with uh, your parents or your, your family, loved ones? What were your communication options? Uh, the first one for I, I would say two thirds of it was email. Uh, that was the only way I could communicate and I could, I could send them emails um, and I could send them from you know, the nipper side of, of, sure. of the computer. We had Sipper, the, the secure side, and we had Nipper, um, the, the unsecure side. Civil Affairs typically operates in the green, so we, we, we used Nipper quite a bit. And so I was able to send her um, a note and my parents' notes maybe once every other day, something like that. Sure. Um, I would take pictures, I would build PowerPoints, and then I would send that off. So I, I chronicled a lot of what I did uh, via PowerPoint and, and pictures and, and make sure I did that. Now that was two thirds. And then the final third, um, there was a engineer uh, unit that put in one of their trailers and they actually had a satellite phone. Mm. And I was able to do some voice communication um, occasionally um, through through them. Okay. Were you receiving any any traditional U.S. Postal Service type mail? Was was mail flowing to you? Mail was absolutely flowing to me. I mean, even with the you know they had to be all brought up on Chinooks, but uh, mail mail was delivered. It would take a couple of weeks for it to get there, but mail was awesome. And uh, at two in the morning. Uh, when you heard that the bird was down and they needed runners to go get the mail, uh, a lot of people got up and, and, and helped get the mail. Sure. Um, and I, a uh, story on that, uh, I became an unpopular person for a couple hours. Uh, my wife um, did a book drive. I asked her, could she sponsor a book drive back in the States and collect books for children in English so that I could distribute them on patrols? Sure. And she did a book drive in, in the local kind of League City, Houston area. And she sent up probably at least 25, maybe 30 of those flat rate boxes. I think it was like eight bucks at the time, full of books. Well, let me tell you, the people in the 173rd that had to handle the 30 boxes of all my books at 2 in the morning were, were not happy with me. <laughs> Creedon, sir, can you please get all your all That's these boxes? Books. Yeah, it was a lot of books. And it, yes, okay, I got them. Um, a, a little side note on that, uh, Barbara Bush um, actually donated books to that drive and came down and gave a bag of books uh, on behalf of that. So that was really, really cool. Yeah, so we were talking about the, the book campaign, and you mentioned that uh, there was something relating to First Lady Bush. First Barbara Lady Bush. Barbara Bush yeah. Yeah. Uh, came down this. So this is uh, um, uh, 2008. She uh, came down with a bag of books and donated it to, to her church, and that was one of the drop-off points for Sherry, and uh, that was awesome. So uh, uh, it's a testament to the Bush family. They, they were connected to the Houston and education and... Uh, it was it was it was fun to know, learn that she had taken the time right. to do that, and it was her way of making a small difference. And we distributed uh, books all throughout that that part of the Kunar and Nuristan, and uh, well, hopefully we made a difference. We'll see. Was was Sherry actually there when Mrs. Bush came in? No, she wasn't. Okay, uh, yeah. she but she heard about yeah, it, yeah. and she was like, "Wow, that's cool." So that's, uh, uh, well, that's neat. Yeah. Well, so in addition, we talked about the mail coming in and your communication. What about? And it sounds like you guys were really busy, but there, I'm sure you had some downtime. Were there any MWR, like morale, welfare, recreation opportunities or free time opportunities that you had? Uh, a little bit. Uh, more on the second tour than the first tour. Mazar Sharif was a, a major base, and so it had all the, the traditional you know, trappings of, of, of a large base. The first one... Uh, we were intense, mm -hmm. and so our MWR had basically two elements. We had a gym in a tent, and then we had a small area that had hand-me-down books. I think it was a, a VCR and some tapes and a small TV, and that was really it. So there wasn't there wasn't much to the the MWR world at that point. Um, but the gym, um, we, we made, we made the best use of it and, uh, 
I spent a lot of time in there. Yeah, and soldiers will find ways to keep themselves uh, busy, I'm sure. They will, they will. And, and on the first tour, we, we were busy. Uh, I'm not going to say uh, I was in you know, contact with, with bad guys every day because I wasn't. Um, but the unit, the squadron, uh, was in a tick pretty much every single day that I was, I was out there. Somebody was being shot at or shooting at somebody. And so there really, as you said, wasn't a tremendous amount of downtime. Right. We were also, we had two 155s there as well. And they were pretty much the Northeast uh, muscle um, for, for that area. And so they were very, very busy. Uh, and uh, I, I got a, a, a awesome appreciation for field artillery oh yeah um the old school field artillery because they were they were busy and um they were some dedicated soldiers uh doing some relatively thankless work they were good well on, on the second uh, deployment when we were up in the rc north you mentioned some of the international uh, countries were there too the scandinavians the germans anything stand out to you um from your observations of difference of life support or how they treated their military members, their soldiers, versus how the American Army operated? Uh, yes. You, sometimes you, you go into these and, and you think of a country and, and you don't really know, um, you know, of course the U.S. is better than everybody else, right? It's, I mean, I've been overly, overly general with that statement, but you think you're good. Uh, I tell you what, the Swedes, what an awesome military unit they are, and if you if you're a student of history, you know why, because uh, they are uh, and have been historically um, very well disciplined, trained, organized uh, military, and to go on patrol with them, uh, I felt uh, probably as comfortable as I ever did um, with with anybody going out on patrol with them. They they were they were great. Good. Um, the Norwegians. Uh, also had uh, an interesting aspect to them. Um, some of their conventional forces were, as you would expect to be, you know, somewhat okay. They did their thing and they, they went to bed at night. But they had some, I'll call them special forces. I'm sure there was a better name for them that would do their work in the middle of the night. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to be on the wrong side of them. Uh, so it, it was interesting how they may have approached military problems slightly differently, but make no mistake, they were good. And, um, and I learned a lot from that. Yeah, well, that's good, that's good. Well, other than what we've already talked about, are there any other specific incidents that occurred on either of the deployments that were either like really frightening, scary, or actually the flip side, something really funny or unusual that happened in a, in a combat environment? Um, yeah, I'll tell, I'll tell one or two stories. Uh, how about one that's, uh, it, I won't know if it's funny or not, but it, it's just, it's different. We uh, had this place called Checkpoint Delta. Checkpoint Delta was slightly north of Fob Bostic. And at the time, if you, you know, back to my story about Operation Mountain Highway and the fact that we lost that highway for a while that connected us to the other two fire bases, Checkpoint Delta was the end of the road for us. It wasn't the end of the road physically, but that was as far as the U.S. could go north right. because we had lost that road. And so there was always... Um, a squad or two um, at Checkpoint Delta, and they they ran it around the clock. Uh, so when the 173rd ripped out, um, and the first ID collapsed from Checkpoint Delta because it really wasn't necessary anymore because we'd regained the road. And so it, 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 its purpose no, was no longer there. So it abandoned Checkpoint Delta, which was some HESCO barriers that allowed two Humvees to kind of um, block uh, the north and and then the east, and then to the to the west was the Pakistani border. Okay. It was right there, so that was checkpoint Delta on, on a river. And so the first ID in some of their very first missions when they when they got there that was four six cav to try to learn the zone would do patrols up to checkpoint Delta and then spend the night there or spend two nights there just to kind of get their their feet wet on 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 the area. Well, when we would go up there uh, with the 173rd, as soon as we would arrive, there would be um, dogs. And mm. the dogs would come out of nowhere. And the dogs <laughs> would come to 
to the American soldiers and it was like a big reunion. It was like we were part of their extended pack and they, they just bonded with soldiers in general. Well, a dog's life in Afghanistan is pretty hard. So uh, Afghanis don't have a lot of use for dogs except for, for a couple purposes, usually to do with security. And so, uh, yeah, dog's life is hard there. But for whatever reason, when uh, we would roll into Checkpoint Delta, the dogs would come out. It was towards the end of my first deployment. And I was tired. I was angry. I was tired of being shot at. I was tired of always having to look over my shoulder. Uh, I went out on a patrol and I was really, I was at that point where um, it was time to go home. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, when I, when we got to Checkpoint Delta, uh, those doggone dogs came out and this one dog, I, was, I threw myself down to sleep on top of a barrier and this dog just curled up next to me and reminded me, you know, the world is not all that bad. It's going to be okay. It's yeah. going to be okay. I had um, uh, duty that night. So I was a major at the time. I'd been, that was the part after I'd been promoted. And I went on, I went on this patrol with, with the first ID as a passenger. I said, nope, I'm not going to be the commander. I just want to go out with you guys. I'm going to do some inter low key interactions. I just, I feel like I want to be outside the wire as opposed to being inside the wire for this last couple of weeks of, of my 30 yeah. days. Uh, I guess you could say I wanted to be on the attack as opposed to just wait for something to happen. Uh, it, was, it was the night of power there. So once a year when the moon was the right way, um, that part of the country believed that if they did something in the name of God, they would be instantly martyred on the night of power, and they'd have special powers to do it. So the first idea was worried about that, that they, they thought they were going to hit, so they sent out some patrols, and I joined on one of them, so dog met up with me. <laughs> but as a condition for me to go out, I told, I told this crew, I'm like, you are not going to treat me like anybody else. When it's time to do radio watch and gun duty, I'm doing radio watch and gun duty. You're going to wake me up. There's only three of you and one of me, and normally there's four of you, so I'm going to take my fair share. I don't want to hear that majors don't do that. I, I, I need to do it, guys. And they're like, okay, sir, fine. So sure enough, at 2.30, they wake me up, and it's a 50 cal, and I'm on, um, you know, on the right side of the 50 cal, and I'm staring over at the Pakistani border, which is, oh, maybe a half a mile away. There's a little town over there, and there are people in pickup trucks going up and down that road all night long. I don't know why. Were they thinking? Were they probing? Were they testing? Or would were, were, were they just have something to do? Um, I, I don't think it's the latter, but nevertheless, I'll never know. But I do recall being on the 50 cal and saying to myself, you know, if, if the dawn comes and I'm still okay out of this, out of this evening, I'm going to make sure that I take my kids to school every single day that, that I can. And when I get back and Jay, I got to tell you, I've been pretty good at taking my kids to school <laughs> every single day. Said I said, if I can get through this night without, you know, doing harm to somebody or being harmed myself, uh, I'm going to, uh, I want to. I want to make. I'm going to make good on this. On it this opportunity, becomes a special day. It became a special day, and nevertheless, uh, or uh, nothing came of it. And uh, I, I but you never know. At the time, you never know what's yep. going to happen in the next thirty seconds. No. Nope. So I, I credit that as a turning point because I was. I was angry. I was really angry. I was. I, I guess you could almost say I was looking for a fight at yeah. that point in my yeah. deployment. And the dog reminding me that you know the world's not so bad. And, what do you uh, guys have a dog at home? Uh, we absolutely have a dog at home. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and then uh, you know the night of power passing uh, with me on the on on one end of the fifty cal and not having to uh, you know the fifty cal that doesn't have a safety and so what they did is they put a spent shell underneath the butterfly trigger, not having to knock that out and and, and let it go. I was uh, I was, was good. I thought I owed somebody something. Well, you, you mentioned a little bit, so maybe describe either of your homecomings that really stood out, you know, coming back from deployment and getting back home. Oh, boy. The first uh, homecoming I can I can remember, like yesterday, landing in the Houston Hobby. Um, now, we had been back at, uh, at Bragg for a couple, of maybe a week and a half, I guess it was, to do some out-processing and some transition, which is pretty clever to make sure that, you know, 
combat people just don't get thrown back into society and like, well, good luck to you. And they, they try to ease you back in because we're reservists, right? Not active duty. So we don't go back to the active duty world. We actually go back to Exxon or Best Buy or you know, yeah. being a mechanic or whatever, whatever our civilian occupation was before we left. And uh, I can remember my, my, for some reason, my oldest boy didn't get there, but my middle boy, uh, when he saw me and he had his little sign and he was just so happy and shaking and giggling and dancing and I just grabbed him and rolled on the ground and uh, yeah, it was an awesome, That's awesome good. experience. That's yep. good. That's good. Well, and, and I know you're still serving, so yes. this is not a looking back on the whole body of work, but you're closer to the end of your military career than the beginning. But um, how do you think your, your, your wartime and your combat deployments specifically have affected you um, in your personal life and in your civilian career? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, I want to answer it uh, a little bit two ways. Um, on the emotional side, what I found, found coming back from certainly the first one, the first one was a lot harder than the second one. Uh, coming back that uh, my highs are higher and my lows are lower. Um, so when it's time to, to be joyous, uh, I take full advantage of it because you never know when that when that time you know might get, get yanked away. I guess we should all could look at life that way, but combat kind of galvanizes some of that. And my lows are lower. I mean, it, it, I, you see some things and you go through some things and uh, you, you learn the hard way that the world is, is not a nice place. And uh, sometimes when, when people are going through their daily motions and they think they have problems, I go, yeah, well, all right, not really compared to what some real problems are, but it's all relative. So I, I think that's impacted me on a personal level. On a military or a, a civilian level, an experience level, uh, after my first deployment, I did come back a very, very different person. I decided that I'd gone through something and that I wasn't going to necessarily be quiet about uh, things that I didn't see were right. Uh, I spoke up more. I took more position stances. I guess I had concluded that I had somewhat earned it um, by spending my time over there. And I didn't have to just go along to get along or get along to go along if I found something to be egregious or, or contrary to either in case of Exxon, a company position or a core value of mine. And so I became a lot more, um, yeah, take charge type of person. Uh, and that, that, that was absolutely born out of the combat experience. It would not, I would not have right. done that if I, I hadn't, uh, hadn't gone through that. Yeah. No, that's good. That's, that's, that's well said. I like that on, on both levels, the personal and the civilian. All right, Mike, well, you're doing great. We're coming down the home stretch. I've only got a few more questions for you. These are kind of the, the bigger catch-all questions. Um, and again, we know you're not completely retired, but or retired, out finished with your military career. But if there is one thing, though, that you would want uh, the future generations, your children or their children, grandchildren down the road, what would you want them to know about you and your, your military service? What would you want to tell them? I did my part. Uh, I wasn't a hero. Um, I signed on to do it. Uh, I wanted to do it, and it wasn't it wasn't optional for me. It was it was a calling, um, and I would have done it for free. Uh, and I think that had more to do with some of your earlier questions about the family members being in the military. Mm -hmm. You know, grandfather fought in two wars. Father fought in one war. Uh, I got a war under my belt. It, it, it's who I am, and it's what I do. Uh, and after 9-11, it wasn't a choice for me to get back in. I had to get back in. I would have got back in and done anything. Uh, and, and it's tied to um, our basic freedoms. It really is. Uh, I... I believe in freedom of speech. I believe in freedom of religion. I believe in, in the rights to, to choose your destiny uh, passionately. Because I've seen, I've seen the world where, where, where you don't get those. Right. 
And, and that's worth fighting for. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you for the 25 years that I've served that every day I could tie what I was doing to, to an accomplishment for, for the Bill of Rights, but far from it. But I did a very, very small, very small part to further that, that, that vision. And uh, I go to bed at night feeling good about it. Yeah, no, I agree. Again, that's, that's well said too. And as, as, as we both have become senior folks, both in the military and in our civilian careers, you, you get to look back and think of the past, but the whole body of work concept. And still, hopefully, for both of us, there's a lot ahead. But as you look back, you can put things in perspective. Right. And I, and I Jay, I view our role was, uh, if, if anyone has watched the movie you know, Gladiator, at the very end, you see the Centurions form a, a ring, and the two main characters are fighting. And the Centurions are there to say, nobody... Nobody can enter this ring. This, this conflict, this, this war of ideas, this war between the two main characters is going to be in the middle, and we are going to make sure that we stand guard and let that play out. That's how I viewed my service. Yeah. I, I am there to, to, to stand on the line so that our country internally could figure out who it needs to be, what it wants to be, what it's going to stand for without anybody interfering with it. And, um, yeah, that's my small part. Well, and, and there we are. Well, so then the, the last question is the proverbial last question. If there's anything else that you wanted to revisit or that I didn't ask about your, your military time or you more detail, anything that we left out? No, I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I would, I would just summarize it with, uh, uh, I would encourage anyone and, and everyone to serve. And it doesn't have to be in the military. Serve in your local fire department. Serve at the ASPCA. Serve, serve in, on city council. Become a teacher. Uh, just, just serve. Serve in your church. Anything that, that furthers our, our journey in, in a positive way, uh, uh, please do it. And, and this is the way I chose. And if you can choose other ways, um, my hat will always be off to you. Well, again, well, that's that's good, Mike. And so before we turn the camera off, I know you're familiar with the military <laughs> challenge coins. I'd like to present you one and shake your hand. Thank you very much. a friend and a colleague, this has been a great pleasure and, and honor for me. Uh, but that's our, our coin from the National Museum of Americans in Wartime and our Voices of Freedom Project. We really get a kick out of um, doing these interviews, and it's even extra special for me when it's a close personal friend that I haven't seen in a while. Uh, but maybe hold the, the coin up real quick to the Absolutely. camera. How about that? Lean back a tiny bit so we can, yep, perfect. There's the coin. And, and Colonel, uh, before we shut the camera off, I want to thank you for your service. Yep, it's been an adventure. Yes, it has.